Now it's time for us to turn to the Word of our God. If you have a copy of the Scriptures, I would invite you to turn with me to John chapter 18. I'm going to be looking at verses 12 through 27. Uh, here in the message today, we're going to see two men on trial, Jesus and Peter. Um, I, I, I would invite you, actually, if you want to, um, you know, uh, it's not a good idea to be playing on your phone in service, but if your phone's on your Bible, I would love for you to keep it out in handy because I'm going to be referring to it many times. And one of the main things I want you to see is the thing, and you need to watch and make sure that the things that I'm saying come from the Scripture. Not Matt's opinion, but what, what the Bible says. So John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. This is just after the arrest of Jesus in the garden. Now they're going to be bringing him for these secret, actually illegal trials overnight. John chapter 18, verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside of the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now, the servants and the officers had made a charcoal, charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them and standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what, I ha if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what, if, if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man, whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter denied it. Peter again denied it. And at once a rooster crowed. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of our God. And I want to now, I want to pray and ask that he would help us as we open it together. Father, Lord, you, you know how much help I need to be able to preach your word to your people. Lord, I pray that you would give me wisdom and clarity. Lord, I pray that the things that I say, aided by your spirit, Lord, would be, would be your truth, would be a faithful unpacking of your word. And Lord, also for all of us, not only do I need help preaching, we need help to hear. So Lord, would you... Would you grant us your spirit? Would you open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things out of your word here today in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. The Gospel of John is really, you could look at it sort of like a study in contrasts. John writes very well contrasting the difference between light and darkness, the difference between life and death. Truth versus what is not true. Belief versus unbelief. The flesh versus the spirit. 
Here in today's passage, we come, between, we come to a contrast between two men who are on trial. Jesus and Peter. Here we're going to see two men tested to their very limits. In Christ we see a man endure and succeed, but in Peter we are going to witness, sadly and tragically, a man fail. Have you ever felt like a failure? Have you ever felt like maybe a failure as a parent or a spouse or in your job, maybe? We don't like to talk about it, but sometimes we feel that way. Here in this passage, you are going to get to see how Jesus deals with somebody when they fail. So let's look at these two men on trial. First, Jesus on trial before Annas and Caiaphas. Verse 12 says, Jesus was arrested and bound. I, I got stuck on this this week as I was thinking about this message because you know, um, for Jesus to be bound, Jesus was the creator of all things. The creator with His hands restrained. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says that Jesus is the one that upholds the universe by the power of His Word. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says that all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus, and in Him all things consist. So even, I don't know what they bound Him with, whether it was rope or chain, but you know, the atoms that hold those things together in reality are held together because of the power of Jesus. The ability of those soldiers to even touch Him was, was an ability and a power that was upheld and dependent on Christ's own power. So they take Him to Annas. This is a very interesting um, couple of details. Annas, we're told in verse 13, they led Him uh, first to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Okay, let me give you a little bit of background historical information about what's going on here. Annas had actually been the high priest of Israel from 6 to 15 AD. He, at, he had been deposed as high priest by the predecessor of Pilate, a man named Valerius Gratus. Uh, removed him from being the high priest. But after that, five of Annas's sons occupied the office of high priest, and now it's Caiaphas, his son-in-law. So what this is, this is, a, this is actually a corrupt family dynasty of ruling power taking advantage over the people of Israel. Power, hungry, corrupt, supposed to be religious leaders, supposed to be uh, a priest, is supposed to be an accurate representation of God to people and of people to God. But these are very corrupt men. Annas essentially still pulling the strings and with a lot of influence and power. Uh, it's interesting, in John's Gospel, we're told... Rarely, a very little about the proceedings before Annas and Caiaphas. John keeps shifting back and forth. It's, it's kind of like a movie. You get a, a scene of Jesus here standing before these two men, but it will shift back to the scene with Peter over here warming himself by the, by the fire. John is wanting to highlight here Peter's failure uh, with the contrast of Christ's faithfulness under trial. Now, again, a few interesting things from that time period. Uh, these trials overnight were illegal according to the Jewish law. So the very fact of what they're doing is illegal. As a matter of fact, they did a number of illegal things on this night. For example, it's against the law to hold a trial at night. Um, it, was un, it was unlawful to convict a person without the agreement of, the witness, of two or more witnesses. 
it, it was unlawful uh, in the Jewish legal system to even use a defendant's testimony against themselves. Um, here, in, in our government, a person can waive their right to that right and do it, but you couldn't do that there. There, there was no, uh, uh, you were not able to, so you couldn't coerce confessions, right? That was illegal. And it was also illegal to abuse a defendant charged of a crime before he was convicted. If you study Matthew's accounts of these trials in Matthew chapter 26, you'll see there's a, there are a number of false witnesses who are one saying one thing, one saying another. None of their testimonies agree. In Matthew, in Matthew 26, 63, Caiaphas compels Jesus to testify against himself, and he uses that testimony as the basis of his conviction, not to just like charge him a fine, but they're seeking to put him to death, right? In Matthew 26, 63, Caiaphas says to Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus responded by saying, this is verse 64, Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. When he admitted to who he was, the high priest literally tore his robe and said, this man has blasphemed. We have no need of further witnesses. You know, after that, you know what they did? They began taking turns slapping Jesus and spitting on him. What a contrast. The holy, perfect, innocent, spotless Lamb of God being treated this way by wicked, power-hungry, blood-thirsty men. Okay, back to John 18. At some point during the questioning, they ask him about his teaching and his disciples. And, and here we get just one more contrast. Jesus said, I have taught openly in the synagogues and in the temple. Uh, many, many people have heard my teachings. Thousands of witnesses had heard. Ask them what I have taught. And the contrast there is here they are in secret at night conducting a, a forbidden trial. What you have here are Annas and Caiaphas, these wicked, false high priests. In Christ, you see the true and better priest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 refers to Jesus as our great high priest. That's Jesus enduring and passing the test before Annas and Caiaphas. Let's look now, number two, at Peter. Peter on trial before the world. Before we get directly to Peter, I just want to point out a few things to you. I, I think this may be interesting, and I, I want to I strengthen your faith in the historical reliability of the Scriptures. Um, you get a bunch of details in this account that the only way to make sense of them is this is coming from an eyewitness account. And some people wrong, and it's just because they honestly have never examined the historical facts. Some people think of the Bible and Christianity as a, a sort of a, a religion based on legend, and they think, well, you know, uh, nobody wrote this stuff down, but people told the stories about Jesus, and one generation told the story to another generation and another generation told it to another generation, and finally someone decided to write all this down. So who knows what the real truth is? You know, you play the game of telephone. Who, who knows how many times the story changed by the time someone decided to write this down? But you get these details in here. The details, they don't advance the story. 
They don't help to make the point really in any way other than just to serve as little historical details that come along with something that an eyewitness would have seen. So, for example, this other disciple, it, it, it was Peter and an unnamed disciple. Well, in John's Gospel, he writes this Gospel about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You know, there's just one thing he never does in his Gospel. When he must reference himself as part of the story, he never names himself by name. It's usually the one whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, it's another disciple, but he gives this little detail, this detail that it was uh, this disciple, John, was known to the family of the high priest. So he had the ability to go to the servant girl who was keeping the door and get Peter brought in. Just the detail that it was a servant girl. This detail in verse 18, that soldiers were standing, that there was a fire, it had been built by soldiers, and it was made out of charcoal. Like these little details, like who would even, I mean, if you were just going to make up a story, hey, we're going to create a religion, I mean, why would you be throwing details like that in here? All right. In this passage, one after another of these people around Peter recognize him, which is not a surprise because Peter really was one of the more prominent of the apostles. Um, he was one of the closest friends of Jesus. Peter, James, and John spent more time with Jesus. They got brought in a little deeper to see things others never saw. The first denial in verse 17 comes after a servant girl accuses him of being a disciple of Jesus. In verses 25 through 27, two more people accuse him of being Jesus' disciples, and every time he flat out denied it. I don't even know the man. Now, we do need to understand the context of Peter's denials. A few hours earlier that night, listen to what Peter told Jesus. Jesus told the disciples, this is Matthew 26, verse 31 through 35. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Watch what Peter says. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. You know something, I don't think you can deny Peter's passion. I don't think you can deny his sincerity. When Jesus made those bold claims, even though, even though everybody rejects you or falls away, I will never, even if I have to die, I will go to the death before I deny you. I, I, I believe he was sincere. But when it all came down to it, You know, um, a servant girl was the first one to lead him to deny. It, it didn't even say a servant woman. Probably a teenage girl led him to deny the Savior. Peter failed. There's one more detail I just want to pull out from you, and, and this is I, this is kind of where my whole message is is coming to. So, this is this this is what I really want you to see and think about because because here in a few moments I, I want us to start doing some translation and think about ourselves in the story. Okay, this is Luke chapter 22, verse 60. It picks up right here where Peter's denying Jesus, 
And it says, this is uh, Luke twenty two sixty. and immediately, while Peter was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Somehow, these dynamics, um, where this trial was happening that night was in the courtyard. Uh, we don't know exactly, but I, I imagine there's probably like a balcony and they're on some steps or up on a balcony, and there's a there's a courtyard, and probably Annas' house is here, and it's probably a complex where Caiaphas is, is over here. And somehow in these dynamics, um, the, Peter and John have been watching the trial as it unfolds with Jesus. But they're just kind of out here with the servants and some of the guards around this fire, but... At that moment when Peter denied him for the third time and the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and looked at him. They looked at each other. Peter saw Jesus looking at him. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Here's my question. Are you ready for this? What kind of look do you suppose it was that Jesus gave Peter? Do you think it was a look of anger? A look of scorn? Do you reckon it was a look of, boy, am I ever disappointed in you, Peter? Or maybe we, uh, I, I would do this one. This is because I'm, I, I have pride. Uh, I would have probably given a Peter, I told you so, look. You know, to understand the look that Jesus gave Peter, um, you really need to understand that Peter's failure was sandwiched in between two important things. Uh, number one, in Luke 22, verses 31 through 32, Jesus had told, like he's telling Peter everything that's going to happen. And he says, Peter, I, I have to tell you that Satan has requested for me to turn you over to him so that he might sift you as wheat. I can, I, can, I can maybe only think of one thing more frightening than that. Being turned over to Satan, for Satan to try to rip you to shreds. He says, but even though he has done this, Jesus says, but, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. This is uh, Luke twenty-two thirty-two. 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. There's two things there I want you to see. That Peter's failure is sandwiched between. On the one hand, Jesus knew about it. Jesus knew he was going to betray him. But Jesus was praying for him anyways. And on the other end of this thing, Jesus is saying, I'm still not done using you. Peter's story does not end here with this failure. So when you ask me what kind of look it was that Peter saw the moment after he denied Jesus, and then Jesus and him lock eyes, even though no doubt in his humanity, Jesus' heart must have been broken over being abandoned by his friends and denied by Peter. But I believe the look in Jesus' eyes was one of love and compassion and pity. And do you know something? You think about this for a moment. After what Peter had done, I mean, what would a person expect? I would expect if Jesus was going to look at me, it would be anger, scorn. How dare you? But you know, I think what led him to go out and weep so bitterly was that it was a look of love.
no doubt that hurt Peter far more. It, it, it would almost probably been a little bit of relief if Jesus would have been mad at him for what he did. Now, let's think about you and I for a moment. If you're here today and you're a believer, there's some things I know about you. If you're a believer, I know that you love Jesus. I know that you want to be loyal to him and you want to be faithful to him. But here's something else I know, even if you're a believer. And the reason I know this is because I'm basically an expert at it. You and I have failed Jesus a million times in a million different ways. Every single sin we have ever committed, every thought, every word, every deed that has fallen short from God's perfect standard is really, at the end of the day, if you really just do the math on it, it's nothing less than a denial of our Savior. Everything you should have done but didn't, everything that you shouldn't have done but did, what did Peter do after he had failed Jesus and denied Him? He went out and wept bitterly. These are tears of genuine grief over his sin. These are tears of genuine sorrow, not for the, just for the consequences Peter might face, but for the deep guilt of betraying his Lord, the one that had loved him and served him so well. Remember, I keep talking about, I hope this isn't like a movie that aggravates you because there's a lot of you know, going back and forth on the timeline, but... It was just only a few hours before this that Jesus had bent down on his knees and washed Peter's feet. Now, if the story ended here, if I, if I just said, amen, let's go home, we'd all be depressed. Uh, man, it's kind of gloomy and rainy out there. But this is not where this story ends. If it did, this would be nothing but hopeless and depressing. But I want you to see, I'm about to show you here, even in the darkest moment of Peter's life, even though he may not have known it in that moment, that's how it is in the dark moments of our life. It doesn't feel like there's no it doesn't feel like there is any hope when in fact there is. Why? Huh. I'm going to tell you why there's hope for Peter. Ah, to do something so terrible as deny Jesus. Jesus was only hours away of dying for Peter's sin of these denials on this night. Not only that, but he was on the way to the cross to die for every sin that Peter ever had committed or ever would commit, and he knew them all ahead of time. And yet, listen, uh, this is the good news of the gospel. <laughs> um, if you're honest with yourself, I know postmodern people, we don't, we don't, we don't want to hear anything that tears down our self-esteem. But, uh, you know, I'm more interested in your soul and what the Word of God says. The gospel says you are so bad. You're so sinful. You, 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 you've failed Jesus so many times. You're so bad that Jesus had to die for you. But you, my friend, are so loved that he wanted to die for you. That's good news. It's, we can be honest about ourselves. We don't have to hide or pretend. The, um, one of the ancient um, confessions of faith says, although there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, yet there is no sin no great that it shall bring damnation on those who repent. This is good news. Peter repented with a godly sorrow for his sin, which led to 
This is what it led to. Facing his sin led to forgiveness, restoration, and healing. You see, uh, Judas, uh, who betrayed Jesus with a kiss, was also very sorrowful, but not with a godly type of mourning over his sin. He lost his place as the holder of the money bag. He lost his standing. He knew he had the guilt of betraying an innocent man for money. And he hung himself instead of facing the consequences of his choices. As I said, you and I have failed the Lord and denied Him many times. When we fail the Lord, what we need is His forgiveness. We need His cleansing. What we need is the healing touch of the Savior's nail-pierced hands. Now I want to tell you something, and you need to spend some time thinking about this. If you've never heard a line of reasoning like I'm about to, to, to share with you, you're going to have to spend some time thinking about this. Do you know what can never forgive you? Your idols. Our idols can never forgive us. People walk around every day not experiencing the, the forgiveness, the, the cleansing, the freedom, the healing of their souls. Because they let other things take the place in their minds and hearts that should only be occupied by Christ. By Christ. <laughs> There's only one Christ. Your idols can never forgive you. If you make, an, uh, if you make success an idol, you're always going to feel like a failure. If you make an idol out of relationships, and this can be any relationship, it can be a relationship with your parents, it could be a relationship with your children. We make idols out of our children. It can be uh, out of a romantic relationship. We are always going to either be in some kind of fear of losing the relationship, some kind of pain because the relation, relationship's not going well. We're, if we make idols out of relationships with other people, we are placing an incredible burden on them and their lives that they cannot sustain. Uh, I, okay, I got one here for you. If you make an idol out of your theology, your biblical beliefs, you know you can make an idol out of your biblical beliefs or your religious obedience or your accomplishments, you're either going to be a prideful jerk or you're always going to feel like the presence of God is far away from you. Why? Our idols can't forgive us or heal us. They only crush us. We've all heard people say, well, I know God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Every time you hear that, the pro they can't get forgiveness because there's some idol over here. It might be hard for you or them to figure out what exactly that is, but there's something else that is preventing them from experiencing healing and restoration because they're looking at something else other than Jesus for their primary source for their identity, for their safety, for their security, for their acceptance. On the one hand, every single one of us, if we're able to honestly look in our hearts, we know that we failed the Lord more times than we can count. And we should experience godly sorrow for our sins and failures. But while that's necessary, that's not where the Lord leads us. Is that uh, facing our sin, repenting of our sin, confessing our sin, dealing with our sin does not leave us down in the depths of despair. You have to walk a path of grief over your own sins to experience the healing and joy, the forgiveness that was purchased by Christ at the cross for us. And this means that we need to develop a well-worn path that's created from returning over and over again to the throne of grace when we have failed. I never grow tired of quoting this verse <laughs> because I never seem to stop needing it. 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins. 
He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what he said the verse before that? If we say we have no sin, we're lying. And we do not practice the truth. But if we confess, if we confess our we confess our failures, we come to him. Uh, you know what this means? You know what 1 John 1 9 means? When we fail Jesus, we don't have to run from him. We can run to him. Let's pray. This is um Lord. This is unbelievable that you are a God like this who is for us and that you love us like this. You didn't gloss over our problems or the things that are wrong with us. Father, you have thoroughly dealt with our sins at the cross of your dear Son. We thank you for giving him. And Father, I pray that you would grant us um, Lord, if it's for somebody here today for the first time, Lord, maybe today is the first day where you are opening the eyes of someone to realize the, the reality, the extent, really the horror of our sins, that in our, in our sin, while we are yet in our sins, we are separated from you. But Father, that you open our eyes and we see Christ as the perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins, who can cleanse us. I pray that you would grant us the grace of repentance and confession. Lord, be with us now. You know each one of us here. I pray that you would work in our lives for the glory of your name.